me. Sorry. Would you stand with me as I read our call to worship this morning? This passage out of Deuteronomy 6 is called the Shema. Did I say that right, Daniel? The Shema. And we watched a video on this one day. That was It's a great video. But here is the, the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. I've read more than that, but I, that's what I had underlined. So that's why I read what I read. So uh, we've been singing this song all month. And I want to sh- read this short passage out of Psalm. It's Psalm 114. This is where this song, uh, this song comes from that we've been singing all month. When Israel went out from Egypt, the house of Jacob, from a people of strange lang- language, Judah became his sanctuary, Israel his dominion. The sea looked and fled, Jordan turned back, the mountains skipped like rams, the hills like lambs. What ails you, O sea, that you flee? O Jordan, that you turn back? O mountains, that you skip like rams? O hills, like lambs? Tremble, O earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob, who turns the rock into a pool of water, the flint into a spring of water. Psalm 114. Let's sing this together. God brought out his people with a strong and mighty hand, took them out of slavery to behold the promised land. Mountains fled before them, and the seas turned back and ran, and they saw that he was good. God is faithful. God is faithful to his promise. He is with us. He is with us. God is faithful. God is faithful to his own. God has come to free us from the bondage of our sin. Tasting of His kindness, we cannot go back again. Leads us through the desert to the rivers of His grace, working all things for our good. God is faithful to his promise. He is with us. He is with us. God is faithful. God is faithful to his own. And your love as in the past If days be few or many You will guide us to the last 
You have said it, we believe it, every promise holding fast, for we know that you are good. God is faithful to his promise. He is with us. He is with us. You are The all creating one, God Almighty. Through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Our judge and our defender suffered and crucified. Forgiveness is in you. Descended into darkness, you rose in glorious light. Forever seated high. I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe. is I believe in God our Father, 
I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three and one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in life eternal. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints' communion and in your holy church. I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in life eternal. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints communion and in your holy church i believe in the resurrection when jesus comes again for i believe in the name of jesus for i believe in the name
Lord God, as I look around today, my heart is, is moved as I see just so many great representations of what it means to be your church here at Pleasant View. Lord, we're far from perfect, but Lord, we're saved by your grace, those of us here who know you as a Savior. Lord, I look around and I see new believers, I see people young in the faith and their energy and their zeal. And Lord, I see the seasoned saints who have known you for some time, for a long time, as the man, as man counts his years. And I see, I see a, a maturity there and a, a cautious optimism, but faith still in you that comes from you. Lord, as we, as we celebrate so many things today that are representative of your church with baptism. Lord, as in a few moments here, we'll, we'll take together the, the Lord's Supper, these ordinances that you've commanded us to do as an outward sign of our faith in you and your promise to us. Lord, I, I look around and I, and I see uh, people of all ages of many different walks of life here in this room. Lord, I see people who've had victory over illness uh, with my brother Floyd and other people who've recently come through surgery successfully and done well. And I see people struggling yet with the, the ravages of illness like my sister, Sherry. Lord, we, we celebrate here together as a family so many things in our lives. Lord, we'll be fellowshipping later this afternoon, spending time talking. Yes, some about little things of life and the, the funny things and the momentous things, but also those quiet conversations off to the side where we discuss knowing you better and knowing the truth of your word and, and debating it and seeking your truth and wanting to know your truth. Lord, I pray that all of these things would continue for us here at Pleasant View. Lord, I pray that we would seek you in all that we do every day, Lord, that we are living out our greatest calling, which is to love you. And through that, Lord, our other calling, which is to exude you, to reflect you, to be that light to the people around us who don't know you, so that they can also know your love in every single facet of their life. Not just the joyous times, but the hard times. And not just the hard times, but the life-changing times. Lord, just as we sang, you are faithful to your promises. You are faithful to your own. And strong is mighty, and mighty is your hand to make these things come to be. Lord, make us a church that is full of faith, a church that is full of your love for you primarily, to each other next, and to the world around us. Lord, help us to die to ourselves daily. Help us to be in each other's lives. Lord, burden us to be in each other's lives. 
We ask all this in your name. Amen. I'm going to be looking at three texts today, just short text of Scripture. As we talk about baptism and we look around the Scriptures, where do we get this idea? Why do we do it? How do we do it? Who should be baptized? All of those things. So I'm going to start out in Romans chapter 6. If you go to the New Testament, move past the Gospels, you'll find the epistle or Paul's letter written to the Roman church, the Roman believers there, Romans chapter 6. Then I'm going to go ahead a little bit more to Colossians and just read one verse from Colossians 2. And then we'll land on Matthew 28. We'll go backwards to the first New Testament book, the Gospel of Matthew, um, Matthew 28, 16 through 20. I'll pause so you can find your way around as we read through these. But I want you to see the text of Scripture here regarding what, what we did today. I, I think what we did today is summed up on we put salvation on display. That's part of it. Obviously, your lives are part of that too, but we put it on display. A picture of Christ's death, His burial, His resurrection to newness of life. So stand with me as we read through these verses. I'm going to read Romans 6. I'm going to begin in verse 4 and read through verse 11. It says... We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with Him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, or literally rendered powerless, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For no one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with Him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Now just go forward a little bit and find Colossians 2, 12. I'm going to read one verse there. You could read the whole thing, but a lot of uh, exposition and meat that Paul puts around baptism here. Colossians 2, 12 says, Having been buried with Him in baptism, in which you were also raised with Him through faith, in the powerful working of God who raised him, Jesus, from the dead. That's Colossians 2.12. Now go backwards to Matthew 28. Matthew 28, 16 through 20. And these verses say, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw Him, they worshipped Him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, 
teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Father, take these verses now, your very words, your very words, the authority that you have spoken through the Scriptures, take them and drive them deep into our hearts. And let the Spirit of God give us understanding, quicken those who who don't know you by these words, those that do know you and who are not walking in obedience. Again, quicken their hearts to desire to obey you. And those, of, those that are hearing these words and have walked in obedience, help them to glory once again in this beautiful plan of God to reconcile humanity back to himself through his Son, Jesus Christ, and through the gospel work that Christ has done. Make it so, Lord, in us today, we pray. It's in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So again, the title of the message is Salvation on Display. What I want to try to help you understand is that these baptismal waters did not wash away any sins. They merely showed that sins are washed away by the symbol that they represent. It's just like, I was thinking about this, if you pull up to a, a traffic light above you and, 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 and the, the light is green, what does that mean? It means go, right? If you reach down in the shower this morning and, and you reach for the knob that has a red dot or a red H on it and you turn it, what do you expect to come out? Hot, right? And the blue means what? Cold. Those are are symbols. The blue dot symbolizes cold. The red dot symbolizes hot. And when you see someone being baptized, you're watching a living symbol of something that has already happened to that person spiritually. When a believer is baptized, they publicly identify with Jesus and with us, other Christians to identify that they belong to Christ. They are in the same family. The person being baptized is saying, my identity is Jesus. The believer goes under the water, which is a symbol or a picture of the burial of the old self that was enslaved to sin. And in Christ, we're dead to our sins as Jesus was dead on the cross And then when we put our trust in Christ's sacrifice to save us, God's word assures us that we really, really did die. Did you hear that in the text today? We really did die to our sin, that it doesn't have dominion over us anymore. The person being baptized is also brought up out of the water, which is a picture of being raised from the deadness of sin to eternal life and newness of life in Christ. When we place our faith in Jesus and His work to save us and forgive us. We are uniting with Him in His death, in His burial, in His resurrection. And this picture, this symbol of baptism reminds us that we're to respond to Jesus in childlike wonder and faith every day because of what Jesus did. We can walk in newness of life because of Jesus Christ. And we can have, as we did a funeral here on Friday, the confident hope of eternal life because Jesus conquered death. In Him, united to Him, this is what we get. This is what we have in Christ. So an ordinance is is a covenant symbol or ceremony appointed by Christ. It comes from the word order. Jesus gave us an order. He said, go and baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Go, preach, make disciples to all the nations. He gives another order in in Corinthians. Do this. And when you do this, do this in remembrance of me. So an ordinance is a covenant symbol or a ceremony appointed by or ordered by Jesus Christ to be carried out in the local church perpetually till he comes again. These ordinances are a tangible. That means you can see it, you can touch it. You can, it's on display, tangible, visible, reflection 
of the gospel. That's why we do this. Again, we didn't wash Zach's sins away today or Rod's sins away today. They did this to show you that their faith and confidence in Christ, they already realized that He washed their sins away and cleansed them and reconciled them to God and made them new. That is baptism. So the reason I'm reading three texts today is I want, I want you to understand three things. The first thing is Christ is salvation. Baptism is not salvation. Christ is salvation. And we saw that in Romans 6, 4 through 11. Baptism doesn't save. Christ alone can save. And there's so much more if you read the whole chapter of Romans 6 and even the chapters around that that you could, it's so rich and sweet. And I encourage you to do that sometime just to read around it. But if you look back at Romans 6, 4, it says, We were buried therefore with Him, Jesus, by baptism unto death in order that just as Christ, Jesus, was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, just as Christ did it, see the connection here? Now you can do it. It's not through your effort. It's not through your work. It's through Christ. Christ is salvation. Christ brings newness of life. Jesus does it. It's not something you do. It's not something that you try to get better. You make this checklist, and by the effort of your own flesh, you do it. Because guess what that'll do? That'll make you a puffed up righteous person because you'll always go around saying, I did it. Listen, I want you to understand none of you can do it. It's impossible for you to do that, to to reach the righteousness that Christ demands in and of of the flesh. It's, It's impossible. And that's what Paul is trying to help the Roman believers understand here. We were buried with him. Baptism unto death, we died with Him in order that just as Christ was raised, we're risen with Him into this newness of life. So in Christ, there is newness of life. Christ is salvation, not baptism. One of my favorite verses, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things pass away. And I'm, I'm mixing some translations here, I'm sure. But, and behold, the new has come. Newness of life has come. The way I thought about myself all the time, sure, do I struggle with that at times? Yeah, absolutely. But the way I used to think about my, it's all about me. I mean, believe it or not, someone told me, someone told me, um, when was it? Was it yesterday that they knew me as a child? Yeah, it was, it was a guy that was at the funeral. He said, you used to have nice hair. What happened? And I would pride myself in my hair. You know, it's the early 80s, and you part it down the middle, and you have wings. Remember those guys? And I'd look in the mirror for hours and just think how great I looked, you know? That's us about everything. That's what we do. That's sin. It's it's all about me. It's not about any of you. That's the way we lived our lives, and he gives newness of life. Old things that you used to love and thought were so important, whether it's money or materialism or, 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 or just, you know, whatever it is. We let go of those things. Christ changes our hearts. We don't even want those things anymore. Second thing I see is verse 5. Look at this. For if we have been united with him, that word united is an important word, in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. United, we're united with Christ. In Christ, there is newness of life. Verse 4, we're united with Christ. My life is not my own. I'm, I'm united, joined with Christ. Colossians 3.1 says it this way, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things now which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. How about Galatians 2.20? talks about being united with Christ. I have been crucified with Christ. But it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me and the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. United with Christ. Verses 6 through 8 
talk about another thing that happens that shows Christ is salvation. In Christ, we are dead to sin. In what Christ accomplished on the cross, not what you're going to accomplish, when what Christ accomplished on the cross, you are dead to sin. Look at verses 6 through 8 in Romans 6. We know that then our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, rendered powerless, rendered powerless. Some of you need to read the word, meditate on the word, and believe the word in that. That your sin is rendered powerless through Christ. So what happens when we fall into sin? We try harder, right? No, we look to Christ. We look to Christ and we marvel over his magnificent power that conquered sin and death in the grave. And we say, Lord, please help me to understand what you did. And marvel over you and look to you and not to my sin. My sin will never satisfy. But you, the one who conquers sin, you will always satisfy. Dead to sin. Galatians 5.24. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Colossians 3, 2 through 5. Set your mind on things that are above, not on the things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. And then then he gives some examples. Sexual immorality is not your identity, people, no matter what you prefer. You're dead to that. Impurity, passion evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Dead to sin. And here's the good news. Eternal life, verses 9 through 11 in Romans 6. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God That's our our life in Christ. The life I now live, I want to live to God, not to Wally and the puffy hair and wings and all that. Not to that. So you must also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So first point, again, Christ is salvation. Baptism is not salvation. I don't want to baptize you if you are not in Christ. It will not help you. It will not do anything for you. As a matter of fact, it will lead you astray because you will put confidence in a baptism and not in the Lord Jesus Christ alone who can save. And that's why, again, I'm trying to start a new trend. I'm, I'm asking these guys to write out their testimony. I'm asking them to think through what Christ has done. And that's very challenging. People that aren't used to standing up in front of people and speaking and and, 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 you know, and, and Rod is, has not been a Christian that long to ask him to put into words and to stand before you and to read these words out. But my, wasn't it encouraging for you all to hear that? To hear how they're processing, you know, what, what Christ has done in their life? Christ alone is salvation, not baptism. Baptism apart from Christ cannot save. Baptism apart from the new spiritual birth cannot save. Baptism without regeneration, without the new heart, is meaningless. It's false security. It's false hope. Water baptism is an outward act with physical elements that in themselves have no power to change us spiritually. Now, now I'm going to just, before I move on, I'm just going to say that some people who would call themselves brothers and sisters in the faith, they do believe that baptism is not symbolic, but rather salvific. You know, it it brings salvation. It's salvific for justification in Christ. And, And I declare to you that if that is true, then that makes baptism a work necessary for salvation and opposes the meaning of grace And faith. And and they're sincere about it, and they'll give you this proof text. The proof text is in Mark 16, 15, and 16. I'm going to read it. 
those two verses. Jesus said to them, this is, this is Mark's parallel of what we read in Matthew 28. This is how Mark renders it in the Gospel of Mark. Jesus said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. You ever met somebody who brought up that verse to you? And said to you, you're not saved unless you've been baptized. I met, I, I've told this story over and over again, but the man on the plane coming back from the pastor's conference. And, and he, he saw me opening, reading my Bible, going over my notes. I just at this glorious pastor's conference, and I was like in the third heaven or something. <laughs> and he looks down, he said, is that a Bible? I said, yeah. He said, what are you reading? I said, I'm just looking over my notes. I was at this pastor's conference. Are you a believer? Yeah. Yeah, I am. He said, then you've been baptized, right? And I said, well, obviously I've been baptized. But then that started to bother me, and I said, well, what did you mean by that? And he said, well, there is no salvation apart from baptism. And I just looked at him and said, well, I hope the plane goes down over water then if I, if, if I were lost, you know, and, and, and got saved by your testimony or whatever, or by, the, by the word of God that you shared with me. But let me just say about that verse, it simply points out that the common and regular practice of the disciples, and we see this in the book of Acts. We're going to look at it here in a minute. The common and regular practice of the disciples after believing in Jesus was identifying with Jesus through baptism. That's the common and regular practice. In other words, it was a no-brainer. If you're saved, you'll be baptized because it follows obedience to Christ. And it, it lets other people know, like happened here today, that you are identifying with Christ, that you, you belong to Him, you're trusting in Him. It's Him and Him alone. The obvious outward act of displaying saving faith in the New Testament was baptism. That was the first and obvious act of obedience that people went through in order to show that they belong to Christ. Belief, or you could call it saving faith, or being born again, or trusting in Christ. Belief was always followed by obedience through baptism, as much as we can see in the Scriptures, especially in the book of Acts. The Bible ties baptism to salvation, but it isn't the act of baptism that saves. Maybe that's a good way to say it. The Bible ties Ties baptism to salvation, but baptism is not what saves Christ alone. And we get that very clearly then when Paul writes to the Ephesian church in Ephesians 2, 8. And you know this verse. For by baptism you have been saved through faith. Is that what it says? What does it say? For by grace you have been saved. He declares you saved through faith. And even this is not of your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of baptism or works, so that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand. And I don't think we take much time to think about that verse. But the reason you can't boast is because God thought about it a long time before you ever did help the old lady across the street or or, you know, did whatever you did that you want to brag about, being baptized. God knew, God knew Rod Kuzer and Zach Kiefer were going to be baptized today. He wasn't sitting there in heaven. Well, that's a surprise. I've been working on those guys a long time. I'm glad they made the decision to do that. He's not a God like that. He had it prepared beforehand that they should do these things. So it's clear. Again, let me, let me just say that Mark... The implicit, implicit teaching of Mark here is that the obvious thing to do is if you're saved, be baptized. And that's why I made the statement that I did before. If you are a follower of Jesus in here this morning and you've never, you've never followed through in obedience to the waters of baptism, I beseech you, brothers and sisters, to do so, to do it, to do it. I will help you do it. I know, I know it's nerve-wracking. And I know it's a little, you get a little anxious. I mean, there's Pastor Wally in the pool of water with me. What if he drops me or, you know, 
all of those things. But listen, press through all that. Press through all that and think about the saving act that Christ did on your behalf and say, hey, I want to, I want to do this to identify with my Lord, my Savior. Number two, so if Christ is salvation, what is baptism? You already know. Baptism is illustration. Having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God. That's that verse in Colossians 2.12. Baptism is meant to be salvation on display. Like, I don't know how many of you may have made professions of faith. Maybe you don't talk about it much. Maybe you think it's a private matter on your part. One thing that you do that Christ wants you to do is make it public. And one of the ways you make it public or you put on display, not this is not about you getting glory. This is about Christ and what he's done in you. I want to show everybody a picture of that through the waters of baptism. So baptism is an outward and public demonstration of the internal regenerating and cleansing work that God is already, has already done in you and is continuing to do in you. The main purpose of baptism is to symbolize it's what Colossians lends to here in Colossians 2.12, to illustrate, to dramatize in a physical, tangible way what has happened to the believer spiritually. Here's what it pictures. Baptism pictures Christ's saving work in this, that the penalty of sin has been paid. His death on the cross. The power of sin has been broken. The penalty, you're saved from the penalty. So, so that means, you know, he doesn't hold it against you anymore. The power of sin is broken. That means you don't have to do it anymore. Not because of your own effort, but because he's already, he already broke the power of sin. And the third thing it represents is the presence of sin is going to be removed, especially you know, when we read some of Paul's accounts, he ties it into the resurrection and resurrected bodies and coming into the fullness of it. So the biblical teaching concerning baptism is always, always and consistently belief in Christ followed by baptism by immersion. We never read ever, ever of the baptism of babies in the text of Scripture. Now, I have brothers that believe that, Brothers that are solid in, in every other way. But, but I, you know, the one thing that just haunts me is I never see one clear example of the baptism of babies in Scripture ever. And on the other hand, I have at least 11 accounts in the book of Acts where Paul or whoever wrote Acts, uh, what, the, uh, Luke, thank you, <laughs> Luke. Uh, Paul just automatically always flows out of my mouth because he wrote most of the New Testament. But Luke, Luke goes out of his way in every instance to say they believed, then they were baptized. They believed, then they were baptized. They believed on the Lord Jesus, then they were baptized. Babies can't communicate that. So, so I, I struggle with that. I just don't see one example. Now, I know we can go back and we could take Andrew's sermon last week, which some of them do, and and we apply circumcision over to it, but that is a leap and a jump and some really, really fantastic spiritual gymnastics to get from there to here when, when Scripture is so clear otherwise. And again, I have brothers that are Presbyterians that I love, I listen to. I, I immerse myself in their teachings sometimes, but on this one thing, I can't come to grips with this. I just can't. Can't come to grips because, and here's the reason, there are so many obvious scriptures that say otherwise. Let me give you a few. I'm going to just throw them up here real quick. Acts 2.41. Notice the way um, this is written here, the way Luke writes it. So those who received his word, what did they do first? They received his word, were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. You better pack your lunches for that baptism service if you're going to be a witness there, right? You better pack a few lunches, maybe. I don't know how long that might have lasted. But wow, 
How about Acts 8, 12? But when they believed, Philip, as he preached the good news, what did they do? They believed. They believed Philip when he preached the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. Then they were baptized, both men and women. Acts 8, 13. Even Simon himself believed. He was a sorcerer. By the way, his conversion according to Luke, was not, was not real. Later on, he, he does some whacked out things that you know, didn't fall in line with the teachings of Jesus. So as far as we can kind of discern, he may have not been a true follower, but it says here he believed. He believed what they were saying. And after being baptized, he continued with Philip and seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. We find out that it was those miracles and those signs that were, that were amazing, but it seems like he really didn't have a confident expectation and faith in, in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. How about this one, Acts 8.36? And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down in the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. And I should have read a few verses previous to that because that's, that's the exposition narrative that helps us understand that this eunuch believed. He believed what, what Philip was saying here. How about Acts 9, 17? Look at our, our beloved brother the Apostle Paul here. So Ananias departed and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent to me that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight and then he rose and was baptized. Paul, Saul, believed and he was baptized. Believed baptized. Acts 10, 47, Peter declared, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people? It was Cornelius and his family. They'd already received the Holy Spirit, just as we have, and he commanded them to be baptized then in the name of Jesus Christ, and then they asked him to remain for some days. Acts 16, 14, one who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, the seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized and her household as well, she urged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. She heard Paul preaching, believed, baptized. Acts 16, 31. And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him. This is uh, the Philippian jailer. And to all who were in his house. And he took, took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with the entire household. Two more verses. Acts 18.8. This was in Corinth when Crispus the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household and many of the Corinthians, including him, believed and were baptized. One more. Paul, again in Corinth, said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who has come after him, that is Jesus. And on hearing this, these people, they were baptized in the name of of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, don't you think if there's that much evidence of belief followed by baptism, that at least one time he would have said, and when you have a baby, bring them forward to the front, you know, or whatever, and, and baptize those baby as a covenant sign of the new covenant in Christ. Do you think that it would have been mentioned once in the New Testament? I think it would have been if he goes out of his way to mention this pattern over and over and over. And again, there's a couple of others too that I missed. So I, I believe that 
Baptism is after you have been born again, after you have been regenerated. And that's the way we practice it. That is why we do it. Are, are those who don't do it that way not our brothers and sisters? That's not what I'm saying. We have some dear brothers and sisters who would believe contrary to this or believe that it's, it's the, the circumcision in the Old Testament. The equivalent is, is baptism um, of, of babies in the New Testament at a very young age of, of the promised covenant. But that's not the way the Scripture portrays it. And so we have dear brothers and sisters who believe otherwise, but the reason why we do things the way we're doing it is because we believe it's the scriptural way, the clearest scriptural way to do it. Baptism is also how the church marks out the people of God. So if you are a person of God, and that's one of the prerequisites of joining the church is that you're baptized. We commit to them to oversee what, what, what Rod and Zach were doing not only was to show you the testimony of what is what was going on in their life. They are pleading with you for a commitment to oversee their well-being in their Christian walk. Now, they have the Holy Spirit to do that, and we can't be with them 24-7, and we don't look over their shoulders at everything they do, and we can't get into their thought life. But in as much as it has to do with the church, when somebody gets baptized, they're saying, hold me accountable. I've professed this. I've given you the tangible, visible image of this. Now, please, if you see me living contrary to this, speak to me, pray with me, guide me, love me, rebuke me. That's what you're saying when you're going to get baptized. And that's why some, quite frankly, have told me they don't want to be baptized. They don't want that kind of accountability. And I, I declare to you, if you don't want that kind of accountability, then you're misled by the Scriptures because that's another act of obedience, being a part of a church where you worship together, you, you, you plug yourself in, you belong to them, you're accountable to them. So the significance of baptism, let me just say it should not be downplayed. Baptism into Christ is specific to, to Christians. Christian baptism is biblical. It's, it's orthodox. It's exclusive. You know, a lot of other religions don't do it or they baptize people for the dead or, or, or whatever. They do it in a wrong manner and it's commanded. So that brings us to the last point in the last text that we read. And I'm just going to take the one verse out of that. Jesus said these words to his followers as he's ascending into heaven. I want you, I command you to go, therefore, and make disciples of all the peoples, all the people groups, not just the Jews, all the people groups, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, it's interesting. I said I was only going to stick with that one verse, but really, if you read the verses, if you remember what we read at the beginning, how he starts out, he says, all authority is given unto me. He's just conquered sin, death, the grave. He's risen from the grave. He spent some time on earth. He's seen by hundreds, over 500, 600 witnesses have seen him. Who knows? That's what we have recorded. And now he's ascending unto heaven, and he says to them, all authority is given to me. What a statement. I mean, God Almighty can only make a statement like that, right? Well, that's who he is. All authority is given unto me. Authority means the right and power to do something. Jesus has absolute right and all power to do as he pleases in heaven and on earth. That's what he's saying. I have all Power, I have the right and all power to do as I please in heaven and on earth. There is no authority in heaven or on earth which can call the will of Jesus into question. And what is the will of Jesus? That you go tell the world about me. That you, you go to every people group. You go to the ends of the earth. That I am the one true living God, the sovereign king. Tell everyone. I don't just work for Judaism. As a matter of fact, a lot of the Jews didn't think he worked at all. I don't, I don't just do that. All authority is given unto me. Absolutely no power on earth or heaven can frustrate 
my will. Therefore, go preach it. And those that, those that believe, they're mine. Baptize them in the name of the triune God, the one God in three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. John Piper writes, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus. Without this declaration of Jesus' authority, we could never venture confidently to make his disciples. On what possible basis do we have any right to tell anybody what they should change or what they should believe or their whole way of thinking and acting and become a disciple of Jesus Christ? Unless he's telling the truth that all authority has been given unto him. Only one thing could justify such outlandish proselytizing all over the world, that Jesus Christ indeed rose from the dead and he has been given an absolute authority over natural and supernatural forces so that every human and every angelic being will give an account to him one day. If Jesus has that kind of authority, then we Christians not only have the right but are bound by love to tell other people to become his disciples. Therefore, those who bend the knee of allegiance to his authority, the loving rule and reign of King Jesus, should identify with their king and be baptized. The meaning of baptism develops out of this meaning of discipleship. If becoming a disciple of Jesus means dying to your old life and walking in newness of life with Christ as Jesus taught, then the symbolic act of that conversion should come to signify a death and resurrection in us. So Jesus commands baptism as a normative part of disciple-making because baptism signifies in an outward way what it means to become a disciple. Death to self-reliance and new life of faith following Jesus. So we don't have the right to accept or reject the ordinance, ordinances by our own discretion. Because there's somebody that said, all authority is given unto me, and he commands both of these things for his followers. Baptism puts the gospel on outward display. Baptism is a meaningful act of obedience that connects or ties or identifies us with both Christ and the local church. Let me read you one last quote. This is just a simple book that I received from, from Jim Ellis, and it's called Going Under, <laughs> and he does an explanation, and he, he, he starts out like this. He says, we should never take baptism lightly. From the inception of the church to our present day, many have suffered and even died because they were baptized taking on that sign, that symbol that they belong to Christ. Though baptism does not in itself save, it does shout out our identity with Christ. When that public declaration is made, many pay a huge price for it. It is not just a meaningless ritual or mere duty. Now, I will say that the American church has made it that. I mean, we, we post billboards. If you want to come be baptized, come. We'll give you a free T-shirt. Just come. We don't, we don't expect any questions to be answered. We don't expect any accountability. We want to just wash you, and, and we'll add the number. That's the, way it, that's the way it's done. That's not the way it was meant. It was meant to be deeply meaningful, brothers and sisters. So if you've come to believe in Christ. Mr. Eliff says, if you've come to believe in him alone on his terms of repentance and faith for your salvation, if so, let me ask you a question. If God makes it clear to you that through the Bible you, knew you need to do something, would you be happy to obey him? If so, if God makes it clear to you from the scriptures that you need to be baptized, would you be happy to obey him? You may answer, yes, of course. I say, good, because any person who understands God's will and hears his command yet would not be willing to obey him is likely not even a true Christian. These are his words. And here's how he backs them up. I know that sounds strong, but isn't it what the Bible says in John 14, 15? 
if you love me, you will obey me. You will keep my commandments. And again, in 1 John 2, 3 and 4, and by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. So as I mentioned, before we baptized our brothers this morning, there was water in the baptistry. And we will keep it fresh for the next couple of weeks. And if the Lord is speaking to you and saying, hey, you know what, you're, you're my follower. Will you obey me in this? Then I, I beseech you, I beckon you, not to hear my pleas this morning, but to hear the word of God and what it's spoken. So are you a Christian? Are you a follower of Jesus? Are you born again? Are you a new creation? The old is gone, the new has come. Is Jesus your Lord? And if you answer yes to that in your heart, I want to ask you another question. Will you do what he commands? Will you obey him? Will you be baptized, as Rod said, to publicly proclaim Christ's regenerating work in you and display your love and obedience to him so that others might see his gospel at work in you. I'm going to ask our praise team to come right now as you ponder that question. And if you've already been baptized, I want to ask the Holy Spirit to work in you to help you have great joy and just a marvel over this awesome tangible picture that we get to experience as a church, as a family of believers, when, when someone comes to Jesus and we see it on display, would you marvel over that? Would you thank the Lord for that? And would you, would you ask him to bring others to a saving knowledge of his grace and to take on this obedience of baptism this morning? So Father, we come to you and we just ask you to work in these minutes as we sing this last song, um, before we take communion and uh, just work in hearts, let your word of God be the surgery knife to come in and cut our tender hearts and show us what would bring glory to you, to push aside our fears, to push aside our doubts, Lord, and, and, and to just think to ourselves, what would bring glory to you? What would what would bring edification? What would build up those who would see me get baptized? Help me to, help me to obey you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you please stand? Precious cornerstone, sure foundation, you are faithful to the end. We are waiting on you, Jesus. We believe your love to us. Precious cornerstone, sure foundation, you are faithful to the end. We are waiting on you, Jesus. We believe your love to us. church let the righteousness of god be a holy flame that burns let the saving love of christ be the measure of our lives we believe your all to us
Son of God, sent from heaven, hope and mercy at the cross. You are everything. You're the promise, Jesus. You. Church, let the righteousness of God be a holy flame that burns. Let the saving love of Christ be the measure of our lives. We believe your all to us. Let the glory of your name be the church let the righteousness of God be a holy flame that burns let the saving love of Christ be the measure of our lives we believe your all to us